Welcome everyone. The webinar will begin shortly and will be recorded. Connect with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading on social media. On Facebook, like the page Campaign for GLR. On Twitter, follow the account at Reading by Third. And on LinkedIn, subscribe to us at Campaign for GLR. Please use hashtag Learning Tuesdays and tag us to tweet anything you learn from today's webinar, and we'll be sure to retweet. We encourage you to share your questions, reflections, and observations on social media. Once again, the webinar will begin shortly. It will be recorded and shared with you afterwards. Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Sierra Sanchez and I'll be behind the scenes helping to produce this conversation. I have just a few housekeeping details before we get started. First, we'd love for you to introduce yourself, so please use the chat box at the bottom of the screen to share your name, city, or state, and your organization. Be sure to select both panelists and attendees so that we all know who is here. All attendees are in listen-only mode, but we encourage your engagement by posting questions in the Q&A box. We'll be dedicating some time towards the end of the webinar to respond to the questions you post. This webinar is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. A link to the recording as well as any resources and slides from the webinar will be emailed to on Friday to all who registered for the session. And finally, we'll be posting a brief on-screen evaluation during Q&A and highly encourage you to respond. This helps us with our commitment to continuous improvement. Also, before we start, I'd like to call your attention to our upcoming GLR Learning Tuesdays webinars. Next week, we have an exciting doubleheader, starting at 12.30 Eastern Time with a Crucible of Practice Salon on Opportunity Culture, Positive Impacts for Educators and Students, followed by a session at 3 p.m. co-sponsored by New America on Creating Environments and Conditions for Thriving Kindergartners. On the 21st, we'll have a funder to funder conversation, which will focus on philanthropic opportunities for enhancing local learning landscapes. And then we'll invite for you to wrap up the month of February with a session on preventing burnout and resignation. Registration and information for all of these sessions will be posted in the chat box now, and we hope you can join us. Joining you now is Becky Miles Polka, Senior Consultant with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Sierra, and hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for this GLR Learning Tuesdays webinar, Learning to Read, Applying Universal Design for Learning. And before we start, I want to say a special thanks to Michelle Napick with the Emily Paul Tremaine Foundation. They are co-sponsoring today's webinar. Tremaine has been a leading supporter of models to address learning differences, and we are honored to have them as a co-sponsor today. In this webinar today, we will hear about the latest developments in neurobiology and the science of how we learn, followed by the extraordinary work of the CAST team in implementing universal design for learning models in schools and elsewhere, and how these come together to support all children's learning needs, their unique learning needs. I think you're gonna be in for a real treat today and leave um, with a sense of hope about the important work we are all committed to. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Lindsay Jones. Lindsay Jones is the Chief Executive Officer of CAST, where she works with innovative educators and researchers across the globe to design education systems that are learner-centered, learner -centered, flexible, accessible, and rooted in universal design for learning. Lindsay leads both the strategy and the implementation to ensure that all of CAST's work removes barriers, fosters belonging, and creates equitable education opportunities for every learner. Lindsay's biography is so interesting. Please be sure to take a look at the full speaker bio bios that we'll be posting to learn more. And Lindsay, it's my pleasure to turn the mic over to you. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Becky. So excited to be here today and want to especially say thank you to the Campaign for Grade Level Reading for bringing a spotlight onto this important discussion. Over the last 10 to 20 years, in particular, we have seen so much really amazing progress and great work in neuroscience, in the science of how we learn. And yet, although we're learning so much about this, we are really also struggling to get it quickly, easily, and amazingly into our classrooms. Um, because I'll say just one quick secret, right? One of the things we know for sure is that we are more variable. Our brains are more different than they are alike, which is wonderful. And it's a great way for us to be able to think and rethink how we build environments and how we wanna create systems to support all learners. So I am so honored to be here today as the moderator, and I want to make sure that I introduce our incredible panel. I'm going to go right ahead and do that. So first, um, Becky Canham from CAST. Becky is one of our implementation specialists for the California Coalition of Inclusive Literacy. Becky collaborates with and supports educators to improve teaching and learning at all levels. She is focused on inclusive literacy and universal design for learning. Becky has over 21 years of experience with the Los Angeles Unified School District. Her experience has focused on instructional leadership, literacy, language development, and ensuring equity and access for all. She is passionate about the power of literacy and is excited for her work with the Cecil Project, our California Project on Literacy. She leverages literacy as a means to develop more inclusive and equitable learning environments for all learners. Next, for also from CAST, we have Jennifer Levine. Jennifer is our Chief Academic Officer for Pre-K to 12 programs. Jennifer oversees the design and delivery of products, services, all things related to the implementation of universal design for learning in schools, districts, and states. Jennifer's also passionate about teaching students who have been marginalized and sees her role at CAST as an opportunity to support systemic changes that empower students and really focus on helping us get to better systems in society to support all. Before joining the, the team at CAST in 2016, Jennifer spent more than 20 years working in alternative urban education as a teacher, assistant principal, and principal. Um, so she has like, so much experience on the ground in classrooms every day, just like Becky. We're going to hope that we share some of that with you today. And Jennifer's positive experiences with universal design for learning in the classroom led her directly to us here at CAST. Finally, uh, our next speaker, actually, the amazing Ben Powers. Benjamin Powers is a practitioner, researcher, and advocate who integrates research and practice to benefit children and adults with reading and attention issues. After completing his bachelor's in Russian, he also uh, worked on an executive MBA from RIT, the Rhode Island Institute of Technology, and he holds a doctorate from Grenoble, oh my gosh, Ecole de Management. I, I'm so sorry, Ben, I'm so embarrassed I butchered the name of that. His doctoral research focused on self-esteem and self-efficacy, perceptions of adolescents with dyslexia and ADHD to understand the impact on social emotional well-being and career intentions. Super, super important work. So many issues happen around transition and moving between um, the education environment and workforce and career. So excited to hear from you today. He has additional interests include developing collaborative and scalable implementation models across LD and ADHD, bilingual, bi-dialectal, and vulnerable communities. He speaks on topics regularly related to dyslexia, literacy, ADHD, and executive functions, building community partnerships to close the literacy gap and support the needs of diverse students, and developing sustainable platforms of opportunity for all learners. So we have just incredible panel today, getting ready to kind of talk about the research, talk about the science and translate it into action. So let's start with Ben. Ben, I'm gonna hand this over to you. 
Great, Lindsay. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here with everybody today. So my job is to talk in a very short timetable about some of the neuroscience related to learning. And I'm going to specifically focus on thinking about students who are struggling with reading, given the focus of today's topic. And so before we get into that, though, I would just like to give a brief overview of where I come from. So I am part of Haskins Laboratories, which is jointly affiliated with both Yale and UConn uh, universities. And we have a global, epi we're really a global epicenter for research on spoken and written language. And so when they were trying to figure out the Watergate tapes and what was on those, guess where those tapes ended up? Haskins Labs, right in, at Yale in, in New Haven. And so we have a cohort of just incredible scholars who are doing what we call basic research. So really thinking about really key basic research questions that we can then use that information we glean from that type of research to help distill and inform practice. And so we have researchers from all over the world. We are, uh, we represent almost every continent. And these are household names for some of you who are familiar with literacy research. People like Dr. Marianne Wolf or Mark Seidenberg or Famico Haft or Ken Pugh. So Maureen Lovett. So there's just a huge cohort of just really talented and smart people who are doing that, that basic research to help inform our practice. And really the other key piece of Haskins that's so important is that this research is, it, this research is independent and interdisciplinary. And what I mean by independent is that these researchers come from all different types of universities around the world. And so we're able to work together to really think about how to solve problems in novel ways. And so not only are the researchers independent, but they all come from different fields, whether it's the fields of cognitive science or neuroscience or education research or genetics. And so like thinking about like going to a doctor where you go to like a specialist, like an ENT who might only focus on an ear, nose and throat issue. The beauty of Haskins is that we get different perspectives and backgrounds from research to work together to solve problems. And the last piece that's really important about Haskins is Haskins has been grounded in using novel types of technology to help solve problems. And so just three key things that I'll share with you on this slide. One is that we know that we have this phonological aspect to reading, and that's a huge component of dyslexia. And so hopefully you've all heard about phonemic awareness and are familiar with phonemic awareness. Well, guess where the birthplace of phonemic awareness was? Right at Haskins. And the reason that phonemic awareness came to be, this whole concept of phonemic awareness, was because Haskins was trying to help people who were visually impaired access the printed word. And as part of that, the, the researchers at Haskins realized, how do we segment words, the different individual sounds and words? And so that actually contributed to our understanding and the development of phonemic awareness, which is a really good way and segue into thinking about the value of doing research to help disenfranchise communities, whether they have a disability or there's an environmental factor. What we find out is that by working and doing research in those communities, we actually benefit everybody, right? And so that's actually a beautiful kind of synergistic thing when we're talking about universal design for learning. Another big piece of what Haskins has contributed to over the years is really understanding the brain basis of reading and especially people with reading disabilities. And so I'm gonna to touch on that in just a minute. And then many of you may have also seen Scarborough's Reading Rope, right? Which came out in 2001. And Hollis Scarborough is an emeritus scientist at Haskins. She actually still participates and comes to some research meetings. But Hollis, who has this amazing background of research, realized that there was a need to help distill and translate that research that's in a digestible way for people to understand. And actually this beautiful reading rope that so many people use, she put together very quickly to really think about how to present this information at a conference, at a, a workshop she was giving for parents and educators. And so if we can go to the next slide, please. 
that actually is what generated what I now run, which is called the Global Literacy Hub at the Yale Child Study Center. So in addition to being at Haskins, Haskins has this relationship with Yale. It's part of, uh, it's, it's jointly affiliated with Yale. And we launched this Global Literacy Hub through Haskins about seven or eight years ago. And just this past year, we moved into and became formally became part of the Yale Child Study Center, which is a huge opportunity to grow our impact. And as you can see, this is just a representative sample of some of our scholars from all over the world who helped contribute to this work. But at the end of the day, what we really want to do is just like Hollis Scarborough did, is take that basic research distill it and actually scale it so we can impact as many people as possible because our belief is that by giving access to the printed word we can en enact generational change among children and adults and if we can go to the uh, third slide please and if we can click through this, perfect, thank you. Yeah, and so at the end of the day, our job is to improve language and literacy across cultures and continents. We are improving knowledge of our language and literacy development. And we do this through different types of research projects. We are actually, we have a, a big project right now in Buenos Aires in Argentina, where we're working with kids who have been um, in vulnerable communities and giving them for the very first time access to a scientific basis of reading development. Um, if you can click again, please. And as to be able to do something like that, a big component is really generating researcher practitioner engagement. And so that's another key piece of what we do through the Global Literacy Hub. And then if, uh, another one more, I believe. Great. And then we improve access to research-based practices. So really taking these concepts through this engagement, this bi-directional, these bi-directional relationships between re researchers and practitioners, and then finding ways to scale those out. Um, and so that's really what our job is at the Global Literacy Hub. And although I direct it, I have two associate directors that we will all work together as a team, Dr. Maureen Lover Lovett and Dr. Jay Russell, who can't be here today but I hopefully I will do a good job representing them. And then my third role is actually in a school environment. I'm an executive director at the Southport School where we work with students with learning and attention issues. And so the beauty of all of this is this ability to stretch from basic research all the way down to intervention and how we can help support kids. And one of the most exciting things that I have seen in this space is a growing awareness of people looking for the types of things we do with kids with learning and attention issues in mainstream or, you know, as they say, typical, although I don't like to think about it that way, um, mainstream learning environments that, again, there's this recognition that the kinds of things we do to benefit students with learning and attention issues actually can benefit all learners. So that's a quick overview about Haskins, uh, the work we do through the Global Literacy Hub at Yale, and a little bit more about my background. And now what I'm going to do is just jump right into giving some a basic framework. And so what I'm going to touch upon, one, I'm going to give a very quick background on some, uh, around imaging, and I'm specifically going to focus on fMRI because that's probably the type of imaging most people um, are that most people are familiar with. And then I'm going to jump into and connect that to this whole concept of individual differences and some of the causes, um, some examples of common features that we might see, a commonality among that variability and how that you might see that in the classroom, and then why I'm optimistic. I'm just going to give a very quick touch point on why I'm so optimistic and excited about what's coming down the road. So I'm thinking most of you may have seen these kinds of pictures of brains that are colored or all lit up. And so if you've ever been to a talk on neuroscience or if you're familiar at all with kids with learning and attention issues and you've seen any talks people have given around um, brain imaging, it's mostly or usually what we see are fMRI images. And so what we're doing with an fMRI image, the important thing to remember here is the word bold. Um, and the reason that's important is because really what we're measuring and what we're talking about with fMRI is the blood oxygen level dependent functions, okay? And so that's really what we're measuring with fMRI. And so the beauty of fMRI, the way we can create these beautiful brain pictures that we see in presentations, is that we can really investigate 
uh, brain activity associated with performing a specific cognitive task or behavior. We can actually localize that and see where in the brain what's lighting up. And so we uh, kids get put in scanners um, or adults, and then they're given a specific kind of task. And then we can see where brain lights up with those types of tasks. And so that helps us really understand. The challenge is that although fMRI um, paints us these beautiful pictures um, and has a lot of uh, sensitivity that way. The and it's not invasive, which is really nice too. A big challenge is that there's a lot of noise. And so if you think about kind of like static, we can have some static in the background. And so traditionally the way we've, that fMRI has been leveraged is to scan and do multiple imaging, multiple kids or adults. And then you kind of aggregate that data and paint this picture of brain and the activity happening. Um, it's not really something that we've, um, that's been done at an individualized level uh, to be able to correlate things because of some of that noise in the background. And that's a big shift happening in the imaging space right now, is that we are shifting from aggregating this kind of average, these average um, pictures of the brain, being able to really shift into being able to think about distinct individual differences. And so that's really exciting because what we know about the human brain is that it is characterized by this um, real kind of striking variability, right? This, this, um, and Lindsay said it really well. The human brain is um, is an amazing uh, is a, is an amazing tool for us as humans. However, every brain is different, and so because of that, it's really important to understand what is happening in brain to be able to figure out how to impact and shift different types of you know things we want students to learn or that we want to learn as adults or behaviors and so really thinking about how can we get a better picture of how to support people and um, improve outcomes through individual difference and so um, that you know the brain is really um, uh, dependent both on what we have from birth and so we think about our genetics um, the heritability of traits that we're all familiar with and how that impacts us uh, cognitively, and then also our environment. And so thinking about environmental factors that might impact cognition and how our brain is functioning. And so as a quick example of that, um, one easy thing to think about is that when we learn a language, we in the United States, unfortunately, typically, not always, but typically have kids learn a language when they're in middle school. The challenge with that is although all brains um, among humans are designed at birth to learn any of the languages that exist, as we start to get older, what happens is that the synapses in our brain that give us the ability to learn any kind of language, when our brain recognizes that we're not using those synapses, they, it, they prune them away. It's called synaptic pruning. And so by the time a student gets to middle school, the synapses may be pruned away. And so that might be why a student has trouble, you know, um, with certain aspects of language or, you know, rolling their R's or certain types of pronunciation. And so that's part of why, um, you know, that's part of why understanding how the human brain develops and being able to image it and get real time data on what's happening in brain is important. And also, as we think about teaching uh, students, as if we think about learning new skills, what has to happen in brain, what's actually literally changing in, at the moment, that's another really exciting feature. And again, um, and we actually have two EEG labs where we're doing this in schools, one at the Windward School and one at AIM uh, down in uh, Pennsylvania, where we have EEG labs in schools where students are getting instruction and we can see in real time and collect data around what is happening in brain uh, to, uh, you know, as, as students are learning new skills, or when we see one student who might not be flourishing and another student who all of a sudden starts to take off, really helpful and critical to understand what is happening in the brain when those things happen. Um, so really this individual difference is really, really important to understand. And when we're thinking about the specialization of things like language and, um, and print, the challenge is, and many of you may know this, but the challenge is we were wired to speak, although not everybody is able to speak at, at birth. We are wired to speak as individuals. We were never wired to read. And so what happens is the brain actually has to reorganize itself or recycle certain parts to be able to read and uh, write and spell. So 
when we think about the ability to sing or to communicate a story, again, we our brain is designed to do that. But the writing system is a fairly recent invention. And if any of you have read Mark Seidenberg's book, Language at the Speed of Print, or um, Marianne Wolf's, any of Marianne Wolf's books, um, they uh, Mark's book certainly digs deeply into this, and Marianne, uh, in different ways through her different books, does as well. But it's really about thinking about the different areas of our brain. Um, and I'll give you a specific example. There's a part of our brain called the visual word form area. And that part of the brain is designed to be able to identify shapes, objects, and actually to be able to uh, identify people's faces. So if you can imagine uh, looking at your profile the, uh, and a, a small child being able to see part of a face or part of the profile, and then using that visual word form area to be able to map kind of what the rest of the face would be expected to look like. That's something that we need to be able to do as humans. Well, when we learn to read, that part of the brain actually gets co-opted to be able to link sound to letters, the print. And so that's part of why we see many kids make reversals early on when they're starting to learn to read. And so the brain has to rewire itself or re-network itself and co-opt or recycle features to, um, to be able to do that. So that's, again, part of why understanding the individual differences in the brain is so important because not everybody can do that with automaticity. Not everybody can do that easily. And so when we see students who are really struggling with something like reading or the printed word, it's really helpful to understand not just intervening and giving them an educational program that might help them, but also being able to uh, imagine if we could very quickly be able to identify what exactly is happening in that child's brain, which may be different because of all this variability in somebody else's brain. And that's actually one of the big projects, research projects that um, is being worked on at Haskins right now. Dr. Ken Pugh, who is the president of Haskins Labs, many of you may have heard of Ken. Um, he's very well known in, in the space of neuroscience and reading development. Um, this is Ken's big project. It's a merit award from the National Institute of Health, where he's really trying to look into and has a team of people, uh, uh, including myself, that are working on this to really help understand these individual differences, what works for whom, when, and why. Um, and so I'm just going to touch on um, a couple common features, though. Um, and this is, uh, although this we see where kind of the science is headed. We're not quite there yet. Um, but in the meantime, what do we know that we've learned that's really helpful? Well, we have some common features that are across all types of brains. And so one thing I want to focus on um, are executive functions. And so many of you may have heard of the executive functions. And these are really the processes that help us um, be able to tackle novel, challenging tasks. Um, and so unlike some kind of rote, mechanized tasks we might be able to do. Um, and if you think about learning to drive, at first you're like holding onto the wheel, you're looking at the cars, you're nervous, you're trying to work with the pedals, right? You've got, um, if it's a manual, you've got that whole thing in the clutch. And then you get to a point where, you know, you probably aren't even thinking, I mean, you are thinking when you drive, but hopefully, but, um, but you're not really thinking actively about that process, right? So we need our executive functions um, to be able to learn new tasks like driving, um, to be able to regulate, to be able to initiate, sustain attention, all these kinds of things. Well, the executive functions are a common feature across the human brain. And so by understanding more about the executive functions and where individual relative strengths are versus relative areas of deficit, we can really help leverage and improve outcomes, whether it's in things like reading or reading comprehension um, or other life skills that we want children and adults to develop. So that's part of why doing brain research is so important. 20 years ago, very few people were talking about things like the executive functions. And today it's pretty common. I mean, it's most people have heard of the executive functions. They might not understand exactly what they are, but it's that brain science of trying to understand the individual difference that leads us to that. Um, and another quick example would be something like working memory. If you're not familiar with working memory, it's a good analogy that I use is it's like RAM in a computer. It's your ability to kind of um, hold on or pull different pieces of information and also work with new content or new information at the same time. And so if you think about 
like the MacBook, if you've ever seen that um, beautiful little rainbow spinny wheel of uh, of death on the on the on it as you're working through a project, and you're like, oh no, my you know my Mac's going to crash or it's not responding. Um, it's because the really at the key one key issue for that is really the RAM is overtaxed, and so you may have a super smart kid, right, high um, intellectual capability, but they may have a low working memory. Their their RAM might be impacted, and so learning new information, being able to pull in known information and kind of work with all that at the same time um, doesn't mean they're not smart. It just might mean they need a different structure to be able to navigate that. And so something like understanding working memory through uh, neuroscience and thinking about the cognitive science of that, and then the education component of how we might help structure an educational environment for students with working memory issues. Again, it's going to benefit all kids. Whether you're a high-performing kid and um, you know you've you've had relative advantages, or you've got uh, you know a strong um, uh, intellectual capacity, or you're somebody who's had other challenges, all, understanding all of these different pieces really helps all learners. And the last thing I'm just going to say very very quickly, because I think I'm probably out of time, is just that there is a huge opportunity ahead. And things are going to shift. If you've heard about things like precision medicine, this whole notion of individual difference, whether it's through uh, neuroscience and imaging research or through thinking about different ways and new ways we're going to be able to assess kids and provide um, much more precise types of instruction. I am so excited and so optimistic because this whole notion of creating universal designed environments is going to be really much more achievable um, as we as we look in the in the future. Simply because we're going to know so much more, have so much more access to being able to identify these individual differences and support everybody, every student, every adult at the level at that's going to benefit them to achieve the best outcome. So that's what I wanted to share today, and I'm so glad to be here. And thank you so much. Wow, Ben, that was dazzling. Thank you. That was an incredible amount of information and it was so clear. And I just think there's a couple of key points that um, I want to pull out from that, which it, you know, I think it's actually still pretty new to people to think we aren't wired to read. Our society is so focused on there's one type of smart right or a we built our schools around it and it's so much focus on print to have this understanding that neuroscientists like yourself and others have been able to give us, which is so much deeper about understanding the many different complicated components that make up each of us and why we are so different. Uh, it's exciting to think about. I think it's still new to many people. And the second point is just your, your discussion about, we know that what we learn about what appear in our in our very structured um, sort of hierarchical system of learning, what appear as outliers or in the margins or learners who are not flourishing in that one system, what we learn from them, what we learn from studying them is going to help and does help everybody in the classroom. It helps all of our learners because all of us actually are more complicated uh, as individuals than we think. Um, and it's it's so why it's why it's so important. I'm so excited to work at CAST um, with these in, with incredible neuroscientists as well as researchers and practitioners trying to take the science that you're talking about uh, that we're it's it's happening right now, right as um, at amazing speeds. Trying to take that and really translate it for teachers today, systems today, because we need new systems for tomorrow. We know, for, I know from my work at the National Center for Learning Disabilities, um, the secondary emotional impacts that happen to students who aren't able to succeed in systems because they aren't built for them are things we can probably reverse. Anxiety, high levels of other types of um, response to the many situations where they're not getting the reading instruction they need and other types of supports aren't in place and uh, and the need to really help and support all of our educators. So universal design for learning, which is a framework that is based on research and, and, uh, and 
for, totally focused on the three learning networks of the brain is where we'll shift to next. And so I want to make sure that I invite Jennifer Levine uh, to join this conversation and start talking about how we can put some of this into practice every day in schools. Jennifer? Thank you, Lindsay. And I'm actually going to invite Becky Canham to join me on this. Um, and before I even um, jump in, I would just to love to know if you could throw into the chat, um, how much do you know about universal design for learning? Zero, maybe like I know nothing, never even heard of it, or I know what the letter, what UDL stands for, but nothing else. A one, if uh, you feel like you have a, a sense of what UDL is, um, or a two, if you feel like you're, you've are got this down and you're able to practice UDL uh, in your setting. Wonderful. I'm seeing all over the board here, which proves that variability is the norm. Um, but I will just jump in since I'm seeing a lot of zeros with telling you just a tiny bit, explaining what UDL is. Um, we're not going to go deep in 15 minutes um, into what UDL is or how to apply it, but I'm hopeful that you'll leave today with at least the next time you hear the letters UDL, you think, oh, okay, yeah, 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 I got a sense of what that is. So um, UDL is a framework for teaching and learning that is based on neuroscience research. So it was been so fun to listen to you talk because I'm not a neuroscience and I'm not even good enough to play one on TV, but um, but so much of what you said meshes with exactly what we're finding and um, and working on at CAST ourselves. So um, the neuroscientists who founded CAST about 20 years ago started doing some research into the neuroscience of learning. And um, what they discovered um, sounds a little bit contradictory, but basically was that we are all completely different. We are all variable, but as Ben indicated, there are commonalities across brains. And so they kind of pulled together the areas in which we see variability and made it uh, kind of helped uh, put, put it into a graphic organizer so that when teachers are or educators are planning um, their lessons, they can see, we'll get to it. Don't worry about the slide. We'll get there. We're going to go into it a little bit later. Um, but uh, they can see the different areas where they, they need to be planning for variability. So we see UDL as um, kind of in, in two different ways. One, it's a method for designing learning experiences. And two, it's a lens for how you see education. So right now we're going to jump a little bit uh, just into that lens, kind of the mindset of UDL, and then we'll jump a tiny bit into the design as we move on. All right. Hi there. Um, I too am not a neuroscientist, so um, that was um, a lot of learning and I took lots of notes myself. Uh, but starting to think about um, that lens for looking at education and a way to design, um, we start by thinking about some of the foundational concepts of universal design for learning or UDL. And one of those being the idea that the barrier is in the design, not the learner. Um, when we're talking about design, we're referring to instructional design, thinking about um, possibly barriers in the curriculum or the method of instruction or the assessment, uh, possibly in the environment, whether that's the physical environment of the classroom or the culture and climate of the classroom. Um, one way to um, highlight this concept is uh, this example. Little Sam didn't learn because she couldn't sit still. Well, if we were going to place the barrier in the design, we would reframe that statement to little Sam didn't learn because she was required to sit still. So again, thinking about the barrier in the design, not the learner. If you could show the first slide, please. So I wanted to show a visual, um, a visual that you've probably seen before to highlight this idea that the barriers are in the design and to also kind of highlight UDL. Um, so in the first image, 
you see that there are three people that um, have a goal of watching a soccer game. You can see when each of them has the same tool or same support, they are not all able to access um, the goal of watching the game. So that's an example of equality. In the next image, we have an example of equity where each of the people are given a tool or support that is designed to match their need. And it does provide them access to the goal to being able to watch the game. And then in the third image, we see that the barrier, so again, the barrier that was in the design was anticipated from the start. This is a model or an example of universally designing. It's a proactive design intended to increase access from all. And again, it was designed this way right from the start. Um, there are still differences in the heights of the people, and our goal is not to get rid of those differences or fix those differences. There's no judgment in that difference. With UDL, everyone gets to be exactly who they are and still have access to the goal and still be and are still able to achieve success. And that's one of the things that really drew me to, to UDL in the beginning. It's the idea that, yeah, yeah, we are all different. UDL celebrates those differences. We know that every single person is unique. We know that every single brain is unique. Um, ben talked a lot about this idea that our brains are formed both by genetics and life experiences. You have billions of neurons in your brain and you have trillions of neural connections that connect to each of those neurons. Um, and those neural connections are formed by our life experiences. And you know that every one of us has had a completely different life experience. And yet our classrooms are designed as if all of our brains were the same, um, or at least as if there's some sort of average brain that we should all be uh, teaching to. So I... Um, want to talk about, I'm going to just throw, oops, nope, I don't have it. I will throw in the, in the chat in a second a um, a link to a book, but, but uh, Todd Rose, who actually used to work at CAST, is a um, neuroscientist who wrote a great book called The End of Average. And in this book, he was um, talking about kind of some problems that the military was facing in the 1950s. They had designed these fighter jets and they were um, finding that there were quite a few people who were not um, able to use the jets. They weren't, they weren't able to successfully pilot the jets. And when they went into some research about what was happening, they realized that um, they had designed a jet to fit the average person. They took the average height and made seats to fit the average height. They took the average shoulder length and made the seats or shoulder width and made the seats to fit the average shoulder width, the average foot size, the average everything. Um, and they created this average uh, fighter jet. But when they um, actually went through and looked at the 100 fighter jets they found, they found that not one single person actually had all of those average dimensions. Um, and a brain, which is so much more complex than just body size, um, clearly has no average. Um, so what do we do about it? Well, in the case of the fighter jet, you might guess because this has become common technology now, but they had the option of divide of designing a hundred different fighter jets, one to fit each uh, pilot that was going to use the jet but that was completely not economical. And so they came up with this idea of thinking about where are the areas in which people are variable? Well, they can vary in their leg height, they can vary in their torso height, they can vary in their shoulder length, they can vary in their arm length. Um, and they created seats that could be adjusted in each of those different areas to fit each individual pilot. And that's what UDL does for the students. We think about all of the areas in which 
Uh, there is variability. You might be, there might be variability in your atten attention span, variability in uh, your ability to perceive and make sense of light. You, there may be variability um, in your energy level, uh, but we're variable in many, many ways. And if we look at uh, the areas where there is variability in design so that students can kind of adjust those seats themselves, then we can teach to every single student. Um, so if you could actually just put up the next slide, please. Um, as I was referring to earlier, uh, these are the UDL guidelines. They're probably very difficult to see here. So um, if we could put in the chat a link to the guidelines, you can check those out on, um, on our website. Um, but basically what the guidelines say is there are these nine areas where we can adjust or, or, or design to help students adjust the seats themselves. So we don't need to make an entirely new lesson plan for each, every single student, each individual child. Instead, we think about, well, where might there be some differences I can design the lesson so that a student can choose to maybe uh, sit and work quietly with headphones on the corner, in the corner, or a student can stand up and walk around the room and do some activities that are posted on the wall because we know there's variability in how they might want to engage with or interact with the material. And when we provide those options as educators, we want to ensure that the learners are the ones making the choice and which option to use. Like Jennifer's saying, who is making that adjustment? We want the students in our classroom to make those adjustments. So one of the goals of Universal Design for Learning is to develop expert learners. We think of expert learners as students who are purposeful and motivated, resourceful and knowledgeable and strategic and goal-directed. Next slide, please. On this slide, you'll see some of the characteristics that we um, identify with expert learners. We want our students to know how to learn. We want them to know how they best learn and what works best for them as learners. We want them to know how best to take in information and perceive content and also how they best show or demonstrate their learning. And this helps them as they work their way through school because we know that just in our own selves, how I learn um, if maybe I got in a fight with my best friend this morning is going to be different than how I learn if, um, you know, I won the lottery this morning or um, how I want to, uh, how I learn on a football field is going to be different than how I learn in a music class. So not only are we variable from each other, we're variable from our own selves and how I learned in kindergarten isn't how I'm going to learn when I'm doing my postdoc. Um, so if we can learn ourselves to become experts at our own learning, then we can thrive in any setting. So I'll stop there for a moment because I know, Lindsay, that you have a bunch of questions for all three of us. I do. I do. <laughs> um, and so I want to invite Ben back in, I think at this point. All right. Um, and I know, so, I mean, I think my top question is going to be for both of you actually right away at the very top. We've got several questions in the chat, um, but I really want to start with, you gave an example of um, a, a very broad example in this environment of how a this might look in a classroom. And I'm wondering, you know, Becky, you have an experience working in pre-K classrooms, right? One grades one through three, especially in that environment. Can you describe a little bit about how you might implement universal design for learning in for that age group and in that classroom? Sure. Um in a primary classroom, PK through third grade, um, teachers would intentionally design to ensure that their learners have options. They have choices about how they learn, how they're going to show their learning. Um, if you were to visit a primary classroom that's universally designed, you might see a teacher working with a small group of students. Uh, the students would have chosen 
to work with the teacher, possibly for more guidance or reinforcement or support with the, the text. There might be students reading independently or in partners. Um, some students might be viewing a video while some others might be listening to an audio version of the text. What makes this UDL um, is that all students are learning about the same thing. The learning goal would be the same for all of the learners, but, but the learners, or and, it's not a but, and the learners have a choice in how they engage in the learning to meet the goal. Right? Great. You, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. No, that's you. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying, great. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to add that we would hope to see also to support that expert learning that there was an opportunity for the learners to um, reflect on the choices and the options that they made and to really identify, did this work best for me today? Am I going to do the same thing tomorrow? Was reading with my best friend really the best choice or did we spend the time chatting? That, that would be the case for me. So, you know, really, again, supporting that expert learner learning and those habits, even with our youngest learners. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to, uh, sorry, I just, I, I wanted to kind of just um, reiterate that idea that um, learning how to learn, we, we, we actually have to learn how we learn. It's not just, um, we can't just throw out a buffet of options for students and expect them to make the right decision. So a large portion of universally designing a lesson is uh, creating supports for students, as Becky said, to reflect on what worked for me, what didn't work for me, what might I try next time. Um, and there's a level which, you know, I think uh, in the age of helicopter parenting isn't quite as instinctive, but there is a level of allowing a student to fail, you know, allowing a student to say, oh, I'm going to go work over here because my best friend is working over here and to, and, you know, to chit chat or play around or wrestle the whole time. And then at the end, reflect on, did that choice work for me? And if not, what choice should I make next time? Wow. Sorry, Lindsay, go ahead. No, that's so great. You got to exactly what I wanted to kind of focus on quickly there, which is, you know, Ben mentioned this idea of what's ahead, precision medicine, precision, more precise information about each of our um, learning profiles, let's say learn our brains. And you just think about the our society and the world and what will it demand? We have every bit of information at our fingertips but learning how we can synthesize that, where and we go for good information, what we need to know about ourselves to thrive in any environment. And I wanted to just raise up a comment from the chat that I thought was really terrific. Someone pointed out, wow, this sounds like the end of lazy, the end of implicit bias. Would that not be, right? That would be I, amazing. Absolutely. And with that, I wanted to ask Ben, uh, speaking about, the social emotional elements of this and the way those those types of things impact the brain um you know what how do you, how do those social emotional factors impact variability yeah so this is a great question thank you lindsay and actually it relates really well to what we were just talking about in terms of giving students choice and so there's a lot of reasons we want to give students choice in part because one objective and from my perspective one objective of educating children and adults is helping them become aware of who they are as a learner. And so the more we can understand about who we are as a learner, the better we can situate ourselves in our learning environment. And so it's um, it's actually one of the more interesting questions I sometimes get from parents, especially for kids at a school like my school, where they have a diagnosed or identified learning or attention issue, and they want to know, should I talk to my child about that you know, what, what their profile is. And I'm always like, absolutely. It's hugely important. Um, because like for me, for example, I have some, I have combined type ADHD. Um, and so that's really helpful for me to understand because knowing what that is and how it impacts me, helps me navigate my day better. So there are a lot of reasons again, why, why choice and activity can be really helpful, especially if a student understands, um, you know, what their relative area of strength or, or relative area of deficit is. However, the other really important reason for this is because of emotions. And so if you think about a student who's sitting in a class and they are nervous or they're not comfortable with an activity, and one example of that 
specific to reading is being asked to read in front of the class. If reading is something you struggle with, and the only metric that, or the only opportunity to demonstrate your proficiency with that written text is to actually read in front of the class, what is gonna to happen to that child's stress level? It's gonna rock it up. Well, that's the same kind of stress level that we think about when we perceive a threat in the outside world. So if you're like, you know, in, in the, uh, you know, um, in a jungle and some you know wild animal comes out and your stress level, I mean, think about what you do. Our blood rushes to our brain, right? It, our blood um, you know, goes away from non-essential areas. Our cortisol levels spike, we tense, right? I mean, these are natural reactions we have as humans. Threats in the classroom are very similar. Um, you know, it's why like, you know, it's why we think about, um, or, you know, we joke about like sweating under pressure, right? I mean, it's a reality. And so another reason for thinking about differentiating, providing different modalities or different ways to interact or allow students to um, demonstrate progress or mastery of material is because if we can help ameliorate some of that, what actually ends up becoming toxic stress, and we see this with kids all the time, their, their cortisol levels are through the roof all day, and they come home and they collapse because they've been under so much stress. Or another social emotional issue um, would be something like, you know, just feeling awful to have to perform in front of classmates. And that social emotional pressure of feeling ashamed or embarrassed. I mean, that's another, you know, when we're asking to perform something in front of people in a way that we're not comfortable with, or if we're not really sure what the end goal is supposed to look like, that's not a great scenario for that student either. And of course, the things we just talked about with toxic stress, they're going to come into play, but it's also going to impact their social emotional well-being. And what we've seen from research is that when a student's social emotional well-being is impacted, their performance is going to decrease, their self-efficacy perceptions, which is their perception of how well they can perform a specific task, decreases. That's why we see, um, you know, certain populations of people thinking, oh, I'm not good at this. Like certain populations we've known historically say, well, I'm not good at math, right? Um, no, it's that's not the case at all. Um, it's, you know, that's not how we should be framing things. So the social emotional component of all this has a huge impact. And this is something that we're investigating much more thoroughly. And I'm so excited about that because it plays, it has such huge ramifications for um, lifetime health and well-being outcomes in addition to learning objectives. Oh, hey Ben, can I just jump in there? Um, I, I love that that um, um, example that you gave of a student, you know, having to present in front of a classroom uh, when they don't feel confident, and also want to say present kind of the opposite, um, where there are students who would thrive in that environment, right? Who just if they could present in front of the classroom, that would be the highlight of their day. And so what I don't want you to take away is you shouldn't put kids in front of the classroom or you shouldn't, but to, to think about, there could be two choices there, right? If you want, you know, if you are a student who loves to read aloud, maybe you can volunteer to read aloud. Um, if you are a student who finds that stressful, then uh, maybe that student can uh, be on the part of a pair share where they're listening to it or where they can uh, listen to um, reading while they're while they're decoding on their own or you know some other option for them. So just to, to um, echo what you're saying and talk about, but there still isn't one one way that we want to make Jennifer, sure I'm so that glad you said, I'm so glad you um, articulated and clarified that because that is so important. And, you know, I think the reality is we can't all be good at everything, right? Um, and, you know, we have the things we like to do, the things we don't like to do. We have the things we feel or perceive we're good at and, we're, and that we're not. And it's not to say we shouldn't challenge ourselves. I mean, there's a health, there's healthy stress, right? I mean, that's really important too. But if you think about it, when we're on a team of people in, in the workplace or trying to solve a problem outside you know, in, in life, we all contribute our relative areas of strength. Not everybody is the kid who, who um, you know, like you're saying, some kids, some people want to be in front making the presentation um, and other kids don't want to be. And so it's finding that balance. And, you know, it's the whole concept of cerebral diversity, the, the, the notion that it's our collective heterogeneity that is what gives us this, this difference uh, as in our species. That's the difference of humanity is the collective, the collective heterogeneity of our brains.
Yeah, absolutely. I love the team example. I think one that we use a lot is if you're on a, a team, a, a sports team, you don't want people with all the same talents. They need to have very specific, different talents working together. We accept it in that environment and we don't, and yet our schools kind of are, are designed to push us to just sort of a very finite set of strengths. And that brings me to a question um, probably for Jennifer that's in the, that is in the Q&A. And it's been raised up that not too many educators are aware of neuroscience. And I think this is very true. I've toured lots and lots of schools. Interesting, Ben's school, he mentioned AIM uh, and others. Those are, are private LD schools, schools for kids with learning disabilities. They're typically papered with photos of brains and lots of information about brains but not generally included in teacher preparation as we know it, right, is information about this. And so the question really is, how will UDL be implemented when there's such a great need in just finding qualified instructors? And I think I, I, the actual question is sort of, how does, you know, CAST, you lead our professional development work. How, how is that work unique? What, how do you do that? How do you how do you do that in a school and bring people to a place where they do have this understanding? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what I love about CAST's professional development is uh, how much we model and practice what we preach, I guess. Um, so we really work to make sure that we are um, understanding that uh, teachers and administrators and paraprofessionals and all of the educators in the systems are actually expert learners. They are experts at what they do and how they themselves learn. And so we design our um, professional development to really support um, people in a way that is authentic and um, hands-on and job embedded to use some kind of common terms there. But so we um, work with um, administrators to think about systems, to look at data, to really dive deeply into uh, their own um, environments. We work with teachers and educators to, uh, we have them visit each other's classrooms in, in a protocol called, called instructional rounds where they, um, can look see see teaching and learning in action identify what are we as a team really doing well and what are our next levels of of improvement and they define that themselves uh we have them do something similar to japanese lesson study for those who, of you who have heard of it where they um a, a team works together to universally design a lesson one of the teachers implements the lesson while the others watch um, and pay attention to the students, maybe even ask the students questions about their learning and then come back together after the lesson to say, you know, what are what are the the um, design um, designs that are working and where do we need to change and grow? We have them do video clubs. Um, we have them do a lot of design thinking activities. So it, it's all very um very universally designed, very hands-on, um, and relevant to the actual environments that the teachers are in. I'm not sure that completely answers the question um, about the teacher shortage, but we also are doing a lot of work um, for in um, universities that teach pre-service teachers and are exploring um, alternative um, path to teacher certification, particularly for um, people who come from non-traditional, for, for backgrounds that are not traditional for where teachers come from now. So how can we um, do internship programs uh, to support teachers? How can we work in some of these alternative um, uh, environments? Great. Yeah. And I think al along those lines, it's important to say, I personally think um, universal design for learning really shows respect for educators and professional educators and the profession that education is, um, something that seems to be falling away, but it's a lot about focusing on practice and it, and being engaged and involved and designing and, and not scripted curriculum and not others, which I realize is been a big part of many of our different types of interventions in the past, but it's about the teacher as professional making decisions, 
based yeah. on their knowledge and their um, their judgment. But one question that has come up that I think, and this might actually be for you, Becky, a lot of the UDL principles sound very much like what has been called developmentally appropriate practice. Is there a significant difference? And I guess I'd actually, maybe you could open it a little broader and just say, what is different about UDL as a framework? Okay, well, thinking about, um, I guess, UDL as a framework itself and how it's different. Uh, one thing I think that strikes educators that's really positive about it is that it's program agnostic. It's not tied to a specific way of teaching. Um, it's a method of teaching. It's not a curriculum. Um, it really provides a way for educators to design learning experiences that increase access for all learners. Um, UDL can be applied to in any content area. Um, and like Jennifer mentioned earlier, it's also, it can be used as a lens. So it can be used as a lens to redesign lessons previously taught or to redesign lessons in an adopted curricula. Um, again, to ensure that you're supporting access for all learners. Um, we also think about it as a mindset. I think Jennifer mentioned this too, and thinking about it somewhat broader than the classroom. It's a way to look at systems across a school site. How are you um, designing um, activities for family engagement? How are you ordering materials? How are you designing your schedule? So it's a way to look at um, parts of your system and think about where might the barriers in that design be? How might you design to minimize those barriers to increase family engagement or to make, um, make your schedule more accessible for all stakeholders, things like that. That's great. Um, absolutely. And, you know, we have a question for Ben actually in the chat and I want to broaden it a little bit. It's um, because I think Ben, you're the, you're, you couldn't be a better person to answer this question. Um, it's in the Q and A and it's about a specific child, but I'm going to broaden it at the end because I think, um, I just think knowing you, I think you're going to give, I know you can give a great answer to this. Um, so one of the participants is talking about her son. He's 11 years old, diagnosed with ADHD, cognitive impairments, autism, and speech delay. He is an emerging reader, and um, and this person's seeing signs of, of learning uh, how the student learns, let's say. Have you seen, her question, I think, is so real. Have you seen kids with the same profile learn how to read fully? And this is where I wanna broaden it because I think this is at base the question all of us parents have, right? This is my child, are they going to learn? Are they going to succeed? It just, it holds all of that. And I guess I wanted to ask you, what changes have you seen based on your work and your experience? Um, about our ability to respond to individual differences, understand them and provide new ways of moving forward. Great, well, thanks, Lindsay, for the question. And I appreciate your faith in me. I'm gonna do my very best to try to answer this question. So I think if we take the context of this specific learner, one of the big challenges, and this is why we, or people may argue over statistics on things like dyslexia, it's because everybody uses what's called a different cut point. And so if you think about, and I'll use a medical diagnosis framework because that's pretty easy or usually easier for people to understand. Um, you know, if if there's a, med a specific medical condition, it is usually dichotomous. Like you either have it or you don't. Um, whereas when we're talking about this, the whole notion of human variability in our brains, it's all on a continuum. And so, you may have somebody with who's mildly impacted by their dyslexia. And in certain cases, somebody might not even, that cut point, the decision of like that dichotomous decision, does this person have dyslexia? Do they not have dyslexia? Um, depending on who's doing the assessment, who's doing, who's looking at the student, um, you know, they may, they may have different viewpoints. And so when you're looking at a student, who's got multiple, what I what I like to refer to them as is identities. Um, I don't like to refer to it as a diagnosis. It's, um, I know I gave that medical framework, but I, I like to think it about, about it as an identity. So somebody like I'm identified with ADHD, or we have students who are identified with dyslexia. 
it is not dichotomous. And so, um, the and again, the beauty of that is because of this human variability. And so what that means is that everybody will respond differently, number one. Number two, what I will tell you is that there are very few individuals who are solely like uh, somebody with dyslexia, for example, um, because of that variability in our brains. It's pretty typical that somebody with dyslexia may have, um, and this is an awful term, but it's called comorbidity, uh, co meaning with, right? Um, that it's occurring with. So it's very typical people with dyslexia. I think it's about, um, you know, if you look at uh, aggregated research, it's about 40%, right? About 40% of people with dyslexia will also have ADHD. So yes, are there people who are just identified with dyslexia? Absolutely. But a lot of students are identified or, or um, are somewhere on a continuum with multiple types of learning or attention issues. ADHD, in fact, in younger students, ADHD and, um, and aspects of nonverbal learning disabilities can be misidentified. Or a student with auditory processing disorder can easily be misidentified with a student with ADHD. Um, and, and what does that tell us? Part of that tells us that the symptomatologies, the manifestation of what this looks like can be very similar. It also tells us that there are all these comorbidities, whether it's something like autism or ADHD or um, a Tourette syndrome or you know any number of things that are gonna impact how we learn and engage in a classroom. Um, so to answer this question a little more specifically relative to this student, have I ever seen students like this? Um, certainly I have come across students who have multiple um, identifications that are very clear. And what I mean by that is it's not where you're questioning, does this child on the, you know, do we have that cut point? Are they identified or not? There are certainly kids and, you know, um, we look at this like a bell curve. There are always going to be kids who on one end of that bell curve have a number of co-occurring conditions. What, what I can tell you is that from what we know today about reading research, there are students, um, you know, students who are, who really do have a learning uh, issue like dyslexia, they will likely never read as fluently as a student who does not have dyslexia. Because of the reorganization of our, the brain, the, you know, the reading network in the brain, the things that we touched on a little earlier today, um, you know, will they, can they become a proficient reader? Absolutely. Can they read at grade level or beyond? Absolutely. But they may, you know, they, it's likely they will never be able to read as fluently as somebody with perhaps a similar cognitive profile who does not have impairments in that reading network. And so when you're looking at a student who's got multiple types of um, learning or attention issues, it does become more challenging. There's, there's more to lift. And Back to that example of working memory, when we see a student who's got deficits in that working memory, in my profile, that's a relative area of deficit. It's why I'm having a lot of trouble looking at this chat feature and the questions and every, listening. Like that's that's hard for me. <laughs> Taking notes in school, very hard for me. Um, so when you take a student who's got a deficit in working memory, holding onto that information, processing new stimuli at the same time, pulling that together, um, coupled with some other type of um, deficit like processing speed, maybe they're a slow processor. Again, it's not that they're not smart, it's that their processing speed is low. When you couple those things together and then you start to add more things on, it's more challenging for them to make pro you know, substantive progress. They're going to make more incremental progress. But that's the whole beauty of why UDL is so important. Because if we can give people a ramp into the information they need through a different modality, um, that makes it much better. And for me, as an example, I, I can retain information so much better through audio format than I can by reading the printed word because of my ADHD. I can read, it's not that I can't read, but I oftentimes have to reread that information to make sense of it. Whereas an audio format for me is just preferable. There are a lot of kids where that's not preferable. They hate the audio book. They'd much rather read. So it's all about, um, you know, thinking about how can we be, be responsive to the individual in front of us, both through a lens of, you know, the types of interventions or strategies we know might work for them, coupled with at an individual level, what is their preference and how do we customize that for them? Yeah, terrific. Absolutely. And I think um, if we could get the right technology 
out there to be able to get in kids' hands and they can learn if they if it works for them, if it doesn't, and we take the stigma away that, that acts like it's cheating and we just start getting them ready for the tech they'll have available to them the rest of their lives, <laughs> that would help us uh, move forward so much. That brings, I think, to an interesting question that's come up too about UDL and the evidence that UDL works. I mean, that's also, so that question coming from parents concern, what's the path forward here? Also, I think, how can I look at UDL and know there might be evidence to support it? Maybe Jennifer, could you talk about that? Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, just the first thing I want to say is um, that UDL, as I said before, is based on research into the neuroscience of learning. So we have that it's kind of scientific foundation to begin with. But um, UDL, actually, there's lots of folks out there who are doing studies on the efficacy of UDL. Um, oh, shoot, I should have gotten the link to this. I'll see if I can find it while someone else is talking. But um, University of Hawaii actually just did um, kind of a, a literature review of all of the studies that are, are out there on UDL and its efficacy. And it was actually um, quite exciting to see that um, there, there is strong evidence that um, UDL cause, you know, this word doesn't make it sound strong, but trust me in research, it is that there's, there is um, a moderate um, uh, association between students who are in a UDL classroom and their, their learning. So, and in particular, students with disabilities seem to thrive um, in, in universally designed classrooms. Um, there also was a five-year study that was done in Indiana in a district there, um, BCSC, Bartholomew Consolidated School Corporation. <laughs> um, and they did a five-year study. They implemented UDL district-wide. As far as I know, they were one of the first districts to go uh, completely universally designed. And over the, the five, year, five years of their study, they found that all standardized test scores went up, um, but specifically every single subgroup of standardized test scores went up too. So that includes students of color, students from low socioeconomic backgrounds, students with disabilities, and they went up both in ELA and in math. So that that is exciting. We, there was another study that was done at an urban elementary school um, just outside of Boston, um, where they found that um, over the three-year period of um, that they that they were implementing and researching their UDL implementation, that uh, special education referrals went down, um, discipline referrals went down, in-school suspensions went down, and absences went down. And then CATS itself um, is actually a research organization. So uh, we have an entire wing that is dedicated to research and uh, we are constantly doing studies on um, our professional development and what teachers are learning, um, how UDL, we have a, a great results from some work that we were doing in New Hampshire that shows that um, teachers who had been learning about UDL for uh, two or more years found it to be um, uh, highly or very supportive in their change over to um, remote learning during the, uh, the remote part of the pandemic. Um, and we're currently in the midst of uh, working with several districts to um, measure how that the student outcome, student growth for large scale implementation. So um, lots of lots of evidence out there. Oh, that's great. And, you know, one question just came in that I think is really interesting. Does UDL mean there is no more direct instruction? That's a great question. No, <laughs> it does not mean that there is no more direct instruction. Um, again, we want to make sure that there are options for how, how students can engage in what they're learning, how they can perceive and make meaning of what they're learning, and how they can uh, plan and act on their learning. So sometimes that does mean that a teacher is standing at the front of the room uh, giving a lecture. 
but that teacher may also have um, the um, information up in a way that students can see it visually. And they may also have some handouts that um, assist students with note taking. Um, they may have um, just, you know, those bands that you see around chairs where kids can kick and move around. So the, the um, options that are offered don't always have to be, you know, if you want to learn this way, move over here. And if you want to learn that way, move over here. Those options, I mean, even now you can see that there is, uh, we have someone signing, an interpreter signing on screen. Um, that's an option, right? You may be using that option, you may not. It's not that some of you went over here and some of you went over there. So um, direct instruction absolutely can happen. But what we need to think about are what will be the barriers to students um, engaging in, in, in understanding that in direct, direct instruction and what are some of the different um, supports that we can um, provide to everyone, right? The, the, the interpreter is not only here for uh, people who are deaf. Any of you can use the interpreter if you want to. Um, so the options that are, we don't consider it cheating to, to give those options to everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And you could use captioning on this video, right? Many, right? We learned during the pandemic, more people use captioning than people who are hearing impaired or who it was designed for. That's um, exactly right. And that's the idea. Ben, you actually talked about this earlier, which I wanted to give a little like cheering signal. But um, when we design uh, for there are for people who ab absolutely need a support, that support often can be uh, helpful to everyone. So I would imagine that many, many of the people who are reading the captions right now um, are not hearing impaired, but that there are other reasons that those captions support them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we we are here for the campaign for grade level reading. I feel like this question came up. We must address it. How do you see the structured literacy approach fitting into UDL for literacy instruction for students who are learning to read? So I, I don't know how you want to just, I, I would throw that out to any of the panelists. How do you see the structured literacy approach fitting into UDL? Becky is our literacy person. I'm going to pass that to you. Uh, that's a... Uh... And structured literacy approach is not my um, my necessary, my expertise. Uh, but I think, like we talked about, UDL can be applied in any context, but really thinking about where are the opportunities to provide options for learners. There are things that we know with the science of reading is there are things that do need to be explicitly taught, but how can we incorporate some options to minimize those barriers for the for learners. If we are working on um, phonological and phonemic awareness, how might we incorporate a visual, some hand movements when tap, tap, tapping out the sounds, things like that. So we're still focusing on the same skills, the same understandings, but just thinking again, where might there be some barriers in the design and how can we provide options to minimize those? I saw Ben unmuted. So. Yeah, it was just, uh, no, I, th I think that's a great answer, Becky. And I think, you know, one of the one of the reasons that structured literacy has taken hold is because, and somebody was, at, I was literally just answering this in the chat about this whole notion of the reading wars or in the Q&A, because, and Mark Seidenberg just does a terrific job of this in his book, Language at the Speed of Sight, because what we can do now is we can train systems using things like machine learning to look at outcomes for how what type of instruction is more beneficial? And the reality is when we're looking at reading, what we're really trying to do is converge our speech systems. And we talked about those earlier being most, you know, for most people at birth, not everybody, for most people at birth, those are innate um, with the whole notion of orthography. That, that's our spelling system, our, you know, it's how we communicate through the written word and how we are able to read. And so the convergence of those two things is so important. And, you know, when we map out orthography, when we map out these different things, um, what we know is there is also variability in which pathways are better. However, the underlying tenets of those, knowing, for example, you know, we look, we can go back to the big five of reading, um, things like phonemic awareness, we can't match 
we cannot link the letters we see on pages um, to ever get to meaning if we're not, if we can't link the sounds to them, like we can't then form the words. And if we can't form the words, then we can't then have reading comprehension. And so back to Becky's um, point, it's, you know, the, the beauty of something like structured literacy is taking the core aspects of language and how we know the building blocks of language should be, um, and then finding the ways to provide different opportunities to learn those things. So whether it's, um, you know, uh, through learning things about phonemic awareness or morphology or syntax or semantics, there are a host of different ways we can teach those things. Um, but what's important about something like structured literacy is the recognition that however we decide to teach them, however we decide to provide access, we need to have those basic building blocks to be able to have effective and efficient readers. Yeah, that is, I think, such a great, and, and it kind of gets to the direct instruction question as well, which does mean something, and I guess, in, you know, in um, specific learning disabilities um, as well, or excuse me, in, in the dis in special education, it has a special meaning, right? But, but it is, I think, as Becky just said, it, UDL can is about the way you're designing any of those approaches. So as you've just described, it is important that the science behind reading is that we value that, we continue to work through that, but it, it just adds a layer of being able to be um, a little bit flexible for those um, many, all of the neurodiversity in your classrooms. So I guess the last question would be, how can participants learn more? Where would we direct them? We'll put a few things um, in the chat, but I just wanted to actually sort of open it up to each of you and say, I think I have found this to be such a hopeful um, panel and there's so much hopeful information. I hope people are taking that and the parents who are on here are taking that as we are. There is more out there about learning in the brain uh, than has ever been. And it's all showing that we can change some of the systems we've created. So I think I'd just throw it to each of you and say, you know, what's one last thing maybe you're excited about or you didn't get to say that you want to make sure you say. Um, before maybe, I do that, yeah. before I jump into that, I'll just say I did throw into the chat a link to um, one of Kath's web pages, which has free access to our book, uh, Universal Design for Learning Theory and Practice. It's a deep one. So if you're only peripherally interested, I'm not sure I would suggest that you go that you start there. Um, actually, I will also throw <laughs> there you go, Lindsay. Um, I'll throw in a link to Kath's um, publishing page, but you're also welcome to reach out at any time uh, to me or Becky. I or Ben, I would assume. Um, I also put in a link to Kath, just the general link to Kath's website. So there's uh you can spend days getting lost in there. So feel free to uh, to explore. Did anyone else want to jump in and, and talk about the one thing they they want to reiterate or they wish they had said? I just, I'll, I'll add one, contribute one thing, and that is being, you know, being an educator is an incredibly difficult job. I, I've um, it's one of the greatest joys that I've experienced is working with kids. I having a chance to be a classroom educator. And I think the biggest takeaway from that experience um, as somebody who hit rocky points in school is that we can change, you know, we, we can change the conversation. We all have the ability to change that conversation. And the way we do that is by taking healthy risks. And it's exactly what we ask our students to do in the classroom is to take risks. And taking a risk is not easy. It's a hard thing to do. Um, but Again, none of this has to be dichotomous. It's it's choosing to take that first healthy risk and trying that thing that's different or new and it being okay with the fact that it might not work out exactly right. Um, but the more we can look to the science and, and the more opportunities we can take to really help provide that accessibility in a way that's gonna benefit each learner, um, that's the best kind of risk we can take in the classroom from my perspective. Becky, we'll give you the last word, right? Yes, so thanks. That feels like a lot of pressure. Um, I just wanna say it's just really hopeful um, and inspiring to be on here. So many great comments and questions in the chat. Um, I love that everything we've talked about has been um, really based in science and neuroscience. Again, not necessarily my forte, but um, 
I just love that's the approach and the move that we're seeing in more and more um, of our educational organizations and more and more um, in our educational spaces. So um, love that. And I am going to drop one link, um, which is the link to the website for the project that I work on with CAST, the California Coalition for Inclusive Literacy. So just another, another rabbit hole to explore with lots of resources um, to support educate educators and classroom application. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I didn't I didn't put that in there, Becky. Um, I'll just throw in one other last word. I just for me, um, what drives my passion for UDL is just this concept of celebrating, encouraging, and helping to emphasize the diversity. I think our traditional education system has tried to push us all into uh, one box. And um, I just love the idea that uh, each of us is different and that those differences are what makes um, what makes the world so fantastic. And so, uh, yeah, I'll just end with that, that note of excitement about UDL. Wonderful. I totally agree. We, I, it was It's so fun to be on this panel with all of you. I think there's so much promise. We created these systems. We can change them. So <laughs> let's do it. I will hand it back over to um, Becky. Well, thank you, Lindsay and Becky and Jennifer and Ben and Diane and, and uh, Jennifer, our ASL interpreters. Um, I have goosebumps. I've had goosebumps throughout this conversation today, and I'm feel, leaving feeling really hopeful. I hope you all are as well. Um, this has been a great conversation. We really appreciate everyone who was on. Um, please join us for some upcoming webinars as well. And um, special thanks to Sierra Sanchez, our um, webinar producer who makes all the magic work in the background. So we will see you all in the future. And, and one more time, thanks to our panel and Lindsay as a moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. And thank you for such great participation in the chat. I saved it. I'm going to go read it now. <laughs> One more thing. Thanks to the Tremaine Foundation, our co-sponsor for today. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Bye.